jail, that means getting beat up, that means getting killed. Um, and and uh, in order to get that level, you really have to believe. One of the arts I always thought of a really good organizer is you had to, one, be self-righteous or else you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. But the art was in appearing that you're not, you know. Um, does that make sense, yeah. you know? Um, you know, because you have to have sort of sense of humor. If you come across as you've got all the answers, but you think you do, or you wouldn't be devoting, it's almost like a religious belief in this stuff. You devote yourself to it, it's sort of black and white. I also tell people if I knew then what I knew now about South Africa, how complicated the situation was even back then, I wouldn't have been a very good activist. So I really think that slogan or that expression, little knowledge is a dangerous thing, it's really true. You know, if you know too much, it's very, I think that's why movements at Harvard and Yale, they exist, but they're never really that um, uh, militant, and inspiring, because those people are thinking too much and they see all the gray areas, you know. Uh, here we're just sort of, we have enough blinders, we know, we know just enough to be, to be involved in the good fight, but not too much that it's... Yeah, we we can keep going. What what's your name? Uh, I, I'm Karthik. Uh, I was uh, yeah, I was uh, basically uh, told that you were a great speaker, and it turned out that's true. Uh, so <laughs> good to good to hear you speak. And uh, you know, basically, uh, I just wanted to just one comment about India. You know, uh, the, yeah, we probably will come back to the come back to Indonesia and Suharto. Probably, you know, if you compare to that, India can be described as a loose federation with uh, autonomy and all that. But uh, uh, but if you compare to Indonesia, I think many countries in the world can be, which are not great, can be considered loose and independent <laughs> because because probably the situation in Indonesia was extreme. Yeah. Right. With the military, uh, you know, you have dictatorship, military, and that type of thing. And I, I don't know too much about Indonesia except you know. What you mentioned, uh, so, you know, but, but just you know, India even against the Maoist rebels whom we were talking about, yeah. and athletes, now they are they are they are planning to bring in the Indian military oh, against okay. them. So it's so, taken a long time. Uh, so uh, well, uh, well, uh, well, but that's because that's because uh, you know it is just uh, uh, I, you know there have been other cases in India like Jammu and Kashmir mm. and Northeast which have been under military rule for a long time. So, so uh, I think just uh, just as a statement as somebody from India, I think <coughs> someone in India who uh, a, a person who faced his family was affected by riots once told me, you know, India is a country where the impossible becomes possible. So, so in the sense that they talk about democracy and they present a nice image to the world when really what's going on there is very different, you know. So, yeah. uh, uh, you know, so so I'm saying it's a little more complicated and. Uh, but one thing I want to touch base is you spend so much time, you know, in, in uh, activism here, uh, you know, where obviously we, we, we're not guerrilla rebels, you know, and it's probably not going to be helpful to have a guerrilla movement in the United States, um, you know, versus you've been in countries like Indonesia where there have been guerrilla rebels. So how, how do you uh, say, you know, do you feel that, uh, you know, involved in when you get involved in militancy uh, to a certain point, if we're like taking up arms struggle and things like that, does or did you feel that uh, you know uh, concerns for the ideals of the movement, like you know uh, respecting individual rights, respecting women, do you think things like that took a took a back seat because you know when when things get very militarized, you know. Uh, Often of the space for the space for debate and discussion and uh, you know things like that tend to close. At least that's what's happening in many places in India. So how what was your experience? You know? Yeah, I mean you know military structures are top down. They're usually men at you know are the fighters and at the top. I mean it's not a space that's changing in places. Women are more in the military now than you know some years ago, but I mean that is a male space. Um, and, and, and even if the guerrilla movement is small, 
it can actually dominate the whole independent struggle, that a lot of the energy goes into supporting that. And um, it might not affect things day to day, but um, it certainly puts, you know, in the military, in the guerrilla movement, everything else, you know, I mean, this, this, the, the fight, you know, was successful in that, and everything else takes a second, uh, you know, back seat. Now, I think to the degree that things are progressing <coughs> in other ways, probably strengthens the struggle, you know, where everyone feels like it's their struggle too, women and men. But a lot of these countries, like Indonesia, women's rights is, is pretty, I mean, it's low. It, it, pretty low, low, you know, compared with Europe or the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and the Muslim society, and I'm not, you know, I've married, I've been married twice, not at the same time. <laughs> but but um, I could have been, but I, I, at one point I'm Jewish, but I had to say that I was a Muslim to marry this first woman that I right. married. And then we got divorced and I married again in India. Um, she's also Muslim. Um, but, um, you know, women... I've been in Muslim countries that I, I feel in pretty conservative places. It, the Muslim community in India, especially in the small towns, is very conservative. When I used to want to film, I was making a film in, in India, I could, literally could not film outside for the first year that I was living in this community. You know, people would follow behind me, throw rocks at me, bother me, you know, push me. And, and, and one time I said, this, the guy said, you know, no filming allowed here. And they said, Osama bin Laden uses video. And the guy said to me, he sold out. <laughs> so, you know, in Islam and traditional Jewish, you know, thought, you can't have representational art. Mm -hmm. So that's why the art of the Muslim world is that <coughs> their, their, their script, you know. Mm -hmm. So representational art, you know, I don't know, you know more about this probably than I do. But, but so, I mean, Indonesia, India, these places that I've been, women's rights is not high up there. I have seen a change. I'll tell you, I, I left India in about 2007 or so, and then I was in South Africa for many years. And when I left, my wife's sister, uh, she had five sisters, and they were all married. Well, uh, th no, she had seven sisters, and five were married, and two weren't. But one of the uh, one of her sisters is married to a mullah. He was he had a shop, he's a businessman, but he also was a you know whatever a Muslim preacher on the side, and you know had taught the kids in the madrasa. Um, but he wouldn't even he wouldn't even greet me. He wouldn't talk to me um, because I wasn't. Um, he he knew that I wasn't a Muslim. Other people thought. See, in India and a lot of other places, they don't, even though the Jews are supposedly the enemies of the Muslims, you know, the terrible enemies, most people didn't even know what a Jew was, you know. And in India, because the caste system is not just among Hindu people, um, it's also a Muslims, this hierarchy of cleanliness, you know, um, and my wife's, so, and it's not only stratified that way, but there's different sort of sub-communities that, um, you can tell from their last name, uh, you know, um, the stratifications and divisions are often due to what, um, what your family did for a living, you know. Like, we still have those things in our name, you know. Um, a lot of people still have names in English that tell you what their family used to do. But, mm -hmm. so, um, these, a lot of the Muslim people that I met there, they just thought that, this Jewish thing, or however, I forget how my wife would introduce me in, in, in speaking in Hindi or Gujarati, they just thought it was a different type of, it was another mm -hmm. community of, of Muslims, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so I didn't have a problem in that sense, but this very conservative place, um, the repression of women was intense. My wife, who was a total rebel within that framework, if she didn't wear like two layers of clothing, you know, one of these long sort of jalebi, or I forget what it's called, covering, and then another pant underneath that, and people would attack her, physically attack her, and call her a prostitute and a whore, and she's had the hundreds of men running after her, trying to beat her up because she was, you know, in India. Um, and, and she's from Godra. Godra is a very famous town. 
in Gujarat. <laughs> Godra is where these these Muslim, these Hindu pilgrims went and destroyed. They went to another place to destroy a mosque, and then on their way back on the train, it was attacked by some Muslim militants, supposedly, and the train was burnt. And the, and the guy responsible for the subsequent violence is now. He's the, the president. Of yeah, he's the head oh. of India. Yeah, there was yeah. Hindu rioting. Modi. 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 So he made his name there in the very strong <laughs> Hindu nationalist fervor of, of Gujarat. My wife saw her uncle killed in front of her eyes, the huge crowd chasing him. He tried to clean up, climb over a wall and they dragged him down and just beat him to death. And my wife and, and her sisters, so the men often had to flee because they would just be killed. My wife and her sisters and mother, grandmother, <coughs> at one point they were building barricades around their community and they were armed there with Molotov cocktails ready to fight off um, you know, Hindu mobs, um, and tens of thousands of people were probably killed. But so these are very repressive places that I've been in terms for women's rights. So it already, even with the guerrilla movement, wasn't any worse. In some ways, it was better. And, and sometimes I would say that there was a certain <coughs> principles about you know uh, we're all in this fight together, you know. Everyone has something to contribute, but women there, you know, they're really basically there to cook and clean. Free speech or free speech? No, I mean no one really talks about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can you talk about South Africa a little bit? Is it any better at all for the poor people? And also, did the ANC kind of sell out the back in the day for? That is a very. Those are very big what, questions. What do, you think? what do I think? <laughs> What do I think? Did they sell, sell poor people out for a deal? So I, I think that if you go back and look at, especially in the 60s and 70s, but even into the 80s, there was an enormous fear, uh, and somewhat justified before the 80s, that there was going to be some sort of race war there, that it was just going to get worse and worse, that some sort of more guerrilla type struggle that was somewhat urban would would build up. It never really did. You know, so the models you had were Angola and Mozambique and even in Zimbabwe. Those were guerrilla struggles. Um, uh, and the ANC, when it first turned to armed struggle, um, they had a very, you know, they were very optimistic about its success. They saw it as a big country, mostly rural, even though the cities were, were you know, Pretty, uh, you know, the country was fairly industrialized. Um, they thought there'd be a successful guerrilla struggle there. They were wrong, but but even into the 80s, there was this fear of black-white, you know, race war. Um, and I think, and, and then what you had going in the 80s was a black-on-black -black violence during, in the midst of the anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, especially in the eastern part of the country. I don't have a map up here. Are you talking about Butelezi? Yeah, Butelezi. It's a, a shill. <coughs> well, it's more... I mean, I was close enough to it and have read a lot that I see it as more complicated than that. Butelezi supported... Um, he was close to Mandela. They were good friends. Um, and, and personal things and family ties, they do mean something. Um, he ended up, I agree, he ended up being used in, and allowing himself to be used for his own personal power, used by the white government. Um, was he anti-capitalist? No. Was he a socialist? No. Were Mandela and a lot of the ANC leadership? Yes. Maybe one of those two stage. I think it's, it's probable that Mandela was, part, was in the South African Communist Party, from what I've heard. Okay, and a lot of the leadership was, and they believed in a two-state struggle. You know that there'd be this national liberation sort of. I mean, traditionally it was a capitalist struggle first. You overthrow the czar or whatever there in Russia. That was two stages: well, bourgeois democracy, and then there'd be a socialist revolution that somehow the party would push forward in some way. I mean, I'm, I'm compressing a lot of stuff, but. And I've got a lot of experts here that I'm looking at. <laughs> you know, I mean, they can quote ver uh, verse and, and line of Marx's capital probably to me. But um, so um, I think they believed, so I think they took that and transmuted this thing 
that, okay, first we're going to end apartheid, and the, and the ANC and black people will, and we have a mass militant movement that's fairly socialist in its outlook, you know, definitely considered itself left. You had a labor movement uh, by the time of Kosatu, uh, and, and even a lot of the main unions, which were very militant and radical and of the left. Um, they, I think, thought before the fall of the Soviet Union, etc., that you know, uh, well, we're going to get into power, it might be more guerrilla struggle, they weren't sure how it was going to go on, but, you know, maybe they wouldn't, it wouldn't be socialist immediately. They wouldn't come in there and declare this is a socialist, as they did in Angola, Mozambique, and a lot of other places. I mean, that wasn't so far-fetched, that at that point you were socialist, you know, anti-apartheid fighter. Um, and when the Soviet Union fell, and I think a lot of also the ANC had been out and about in the world, had been in the Soviet Union, we had people that worked with us in Berkeley who had been trained in, you know, uh, uh, dr trained fighters, had gotten their training in the Soviet Union and in East Germany, and they had seen what life was like. And I think, and, and that plus some of the experience in the camps in, um, in Angola, um, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s, was not a good one, where the ANC, and especially the Communist Party that was in control of the ANC, especially in the, the military end of it, you know, Slovo and others, uh, that this very dictatorial, if you dissented, they immediately would say, oh, you're a spy, you're, you know, working with the white people. They were very, very because the ANC was heavily penetrated by the South African security services. I mean, that seems sure. And to this day, there's probably people high up in the ANC and the government who probably did some work with the, the whites. And, 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 and so it was very easy in those camps to say, you're working with the white people, if you, with the government, if you dissented. And there were a lot of people who were tortured and killed, you know, and imprisoned. Some people who eventually came here and were with us in Berkeley you know, in the shanty town and such. But, um, so I think a very, uh, a negative view had developed among enough people that the Soviet Union or Eastern Europe or this communist thing was not so, you know, it wasn't like the answer. Yeah, it was still probably a good thing, but it wasn't so simple, like there was going to be freedom and this and that. It, I think a, somewhat of a negative view had developed within the ANC. And I think that, you know, with the end of the Soviet Union and, and the East Bloc and everything, and they had to deal with the reality of the capitalist world. That's who they would be dealing with. You know, Cuba, what was it, in the 80s? Uh, the Soviet Union helped them a lot. I'm sure the Soviet Union got things, but they were able to help them with uh, fuel uh, um, and other things. All of a sudden, your options were closed off. And I think that Mandela and others who saw things that the government was not going to ever be able to put down the rebellion. I mean, it could suppress it, but it would come back up. I think that they thought, hey, we've got to end this thing. We've got to try and get into power. You know, okay, we'll make some compromises. Um, but they still, when they first came to power, the idea was to empower the people. What exactly that would mean was... was was, you know, a difficult thing, but I think at that point they didn't have a good, uh, a, a, a strong concept of a, some sort of different socialist society. I mean, I, I, I just don't think that was in their heads by that late 80s point. And, and, and here it was, they released Mandela from jail, they're not going to put him back in jail. So they're out there and they're doing this thing, they wanted to end white power as soon as they can, as they could, I think. And so did they make a compromises that we're not going to nationalize everything, we're not going to socialize everything, we're not going to have socialism? Yeah. I think but is it a little bit better for the people? Okay. Slightly? For the first few years, the ANC and Mandela especially, they pushed ahead huge program these vast programs that helped a lot of people. Built a lot of houses, a lot of electricity put in places where it didn't exist plumbing, schools built, you know, a lot of things happened those first five years. 
I think, enormous changes for millions of people. But already by the 80s, we didn't realize it, but a lot of the apartheid laws were already off the books. And there was a lot more freedom than we realized. The first thing was that you know, these past laws were not being enforced. The capitalists, so that's a big question in the historiography or the history of South Africa. What was the relationship between capitalism and apartheid? And up through the 70s, you know, easy to argue that capitalism and apartheid worked together. And, and a, capitalism supported apartheid and apartheid allowed for the super exploitation of, you know, in this capitalist economy. But by the, eight, by the late 70s and early 80s, it was the capitalists, the big ones, who were the first ones to meet with the ANC, who were pressuring the government to make reforms, who said, fuck, we can't, these past laws, I don't know who's going to be able to show up at work tomorrow. I need, these employees have been working for me day in, day out. They've got some level, the basic level of training that I need in the factories. If, the, if, if I don't know that they can come to work tomorrow, this is not a good situation for me. I don't want my workers to have to travel far. You used to have to get up at 2.30 in the morning to get on a bus to travel from these Bantu stands to the area around Johannesburg. People traveled by like five hours to get to work. The productivity was not very high at that point. So that's my, anyway, I'm going on and on about it. I think that the situation, so for a few years, a lot better, but I think that progress has slowed. I think A and C corruption has increased enormously and is a good press, so it's exposed. Um, I think that people still, even if they, uh, very critical of the ANC, they still vote for it. When the first split from the ANC happened a few years ago, they were called COPE. They were people within the ANC who had mostly not been in exile, they had mostly been part of the, uh, what was it called, um, uh, the big, uh, I don't come to me, but in, in the country, the, the movement within the country, they formed a separate party called COPE. And when they'd hold meetings, <coughs> the ANC would just invade it. And, and just the fist fights and everything, and they couldn't even hold a meeting. And that party collapsed. <coughs> so people still don't see an alternative politically, electorally, to the ANC. So even though you might occupy an ANC office protesting, you know, what the ANC was doing, when it came time to vote, you voted for them. So. And still, that, that whole thing about liberation and the ANC, they've sort of rewritten the history that the ANC was the one that liberated the country rather than the people. And it was much more the people. And the ANC was often trying to run up to the front and put their banner at the front. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I just want to ask some questions. Really. Yeah. Uh, or make statements. Statements. Maybe. One of the things that some of us have learned is if you leave capitalism in this place, no matter what your ideas are, you don't transform it, it transforms you. So like the top leaders of the Communist Party are making a million four hundred thousand rand for you like Beleni, Sokwana, and uh, Blade Nizimande. They're, they're making big money. I'm not talking Blaine. billions like a billionaire like Ron Fosa. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm talking close. that that the system, this idea of a two stage revolution that you can first set up a national liberation tied to capitalism yeah. with the World Bank and IMF dictating terms in many ways. Remember, if you have a, a, a divestment movement, whose money is being divested? The big capitalists. They get to sit in on the bargaining table and help determine the outcomes. That's a view that some have, and yeah. I may subscribe to yeah. it. So that's what I've seen. I've seen if you're going to do the job, you got to finish it. Like in Chile, they did a very similar thing. They left the military, they call it a constitutional military. In fact, Pinochet was on the greeting committee to welcome Castro. They hugged each other. And then he was the murderer of the, of the oh, yeah, revolution. Yeah. You can't, because the ruling class becomes frenzied and frightened, and they strike back with unmitigated ferocity. So just because a party calls itself a communist party doesn't mean it's really a communist party. Not when it's embedded in a capital state. That's, that's just an idea. I'd like other people to sail with it. <coughs> All right, well, I had a few comments uh, saved up. But um, I, I want to 
to say I have a, a different perspective. I respect his perspective, but I've never been a Leninist and have never really Trotsky seen is. any kind of, well, it's whatever. Yeah. I've never been any form of derived from the works of Lenin. Uh, so, and I've never really seen a utopian society of any sort in my lifetime as something that was going to happen. Yeah, well, I have to die in, uh, I think it, the human race, like you say, needs to evolve further before that will happen. But um, I, I, I've saved up a few comments. One, house wars, when somebody dies, God, they're nasty, they're the worst. Uh, I wrote a story about what was then called the greenhouse effect, a science fiction story in 1981. So you were people knew. <laughs> um, okay, there was, I remember hearing there was an Occupy camp in South Africa, I believe. Um, in the Ivy Leagues, I think what you're talking about is called paralysis by analysis. And uh, <coughs> my view is it's good to study all sides of an issue, but when it comes to act, you have to strategically oversimplify somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this one is my what I consider my most important point. So my view is that the best <coughs> way to avoid falling into pessimism is to have fairly low expectations in the first place. Um, my view has always been the world with activism is better than the world without activism, and that's why I do it. Um, and I also don't really consider it as something that will ever end as long as there are humans. There's going to be dysfunctions in society, and there's going to need, be a need for people to struggle against it. That's my good. Very good. <laughs>